With the sad news that came through that the racing dentist Tony Brooks had passed away at the grand age of 90, it means that we have now lost all of the surviving winners from the 1950s. It now puts us into that weird position where we're going to start losing some of the heroes from the 1960s, the ones who survived F1's glory years, or killer years if that BBC documentary is anything to go by. If you can actually get hold of a copy of that documentary, I highly recommend you watch it. But notice how I said survived the 1960s, because the way that the 1960s are talked about, it always sounds like that there was a driver killed in every single race that decade, and the sport lost the likes of Wolfgang von Trips, Ricardo Rodriguez, Lorenzo Bandini, and Jim Clark in that time frame. Very talented drivers that would have all had success, or more success most likely, had they lived. It was also the decade where Jackie Stewart, Jochen Rint and Joe Bonnier had the balls to stand there and say enough was enough and started the Grand Prix Drivers Association, which lobbied for better safety standards at racetracks and better safety standards on the cars. Jackie Stewart became public enemy number one in motorsport, and if you've noticed, there aren't many corners on racetracks, if any, named after the Flying Scotsman. Not even at Knock Hill or any of the other British tracks. Because of these three pushing for these safety improvements, drivers walk away from accidents that would have been serious or even fatal in the past. Take Martin Brundle's rollover in 1996 at Melbourne. About four or so months prior to this, Mika Hakkinen was almost killed at Adelaide. But two years prior to Hakkinen, there were two drivers killed on the same weekend. Then fast forward to Luciano Berti at Spa in 2001, Robert Kubica in 2007, or even Max Verstappen ending up on Lewis Hamilton's head. But now, even with the tragic loss of Jules Bianchi in 2015, and yes, I know the crash was in 2014, but he died in 2015, the sport is now in a state of, okay, you have to be doing something catastrophically wrong or be catastrophically unlucky to be killed. And that's, you know, pretty much what happened with Bianchi, I think. I mean, it was totally avoidable, but it was just, you know, luck of the draw. And it's not like the drivers of those days of Moss and Fanjo weren't aware of how dangerous it was. Tony Brooks had crashed heavily twice in his career, one crash at Silverstone and one at Le Mans, and as a result he took care with his racing instead of being balls out and being seen to be brave. Because after all, we're only talking just over a decade after the end of the Second World War and advances in aerospace, automotive and now even space technology were advancing faster than anybody would have ever thought. Brooks said, I always felt it was morally wrong to take unnecessary risks with one's life, because I believe that life is a gift from God and that suicide is morally unacceptable. I suppose there are those who would say that driving racing cars is an unnecessary risk, but I wouldn't agree with that. However, driving one which may be unsound or damaged, while not exactly suicide, is verging towards it. So with that in mind then, let's look at how dangerous or deadly or whatever word you want to use the 50s, 60s and 70s actually were in Formula 1 and see how things then changed into the 80s, 90s and up to today. Because I'm always talking about how Jackie Stewart did this and they changed this regulation and changed this rule and did this and did this and did this but never actually looked at the statistics as to how many people lost their lives in Formula 1 racing accidents prior to 1994 which is usually used as the turning point. So the first person to die in a Formula 1 car post-1950 was the British driver Cameron Earl, who lost his life at the Myra Test Centre in 1952. Now the Myra Test Centre located near Nuneaton you might know from several episodes of Top Gear where they went to test cars to breaking points such as the British Leyland Challenge and also that very hilarious lorry driving challenge. Earl wasn't actually an F1 driver though, he was merely an engineering consultant and he was just testing the car at Myra when he lost control, flipped it and then died as the result of a fractured skull. The first death at a race weekend however was when Onofre Marimon was killed in practice at the Nürburgring in his Maserati 250F. He crashed near Adenauer Bridge and reading the description of what happened to him, well the aftermath wasn't exactly pretty. But then, remarkably, we have to wait another six years until 1958 for the next driver to be killed, and the first to be killed during the actual race session. The driver involved was the Italian Luigi Musso, killed when his Ferrari 256 crashed at Reims in France. However, just a month later, again at the Nürburgring, another Ferrari 256 crashed and killed its driver. This time, it was Peter Collins. In the November of 1958 at the Moroccan Grand Prix, the third driver of that year was killed, Stuart Lewis Evans in a van wall. 
So then, these drivers killed in just one year. That's pretty bad. I mean, one driver is unacceptable in 2022, like going by modern standards anyway, but back then it was just part of the job. But one thing to factor in here is that I'm talking about Formula 1 drivers that were killed in a test session, a non-championship race in current cars, like you know, cars of 1952, 1953 and so on, or any driver that was killed at a round of a Formula 1 World Championship. As some of the anoraks might have been screaming at the screen for a little bit, we've got to factor in the Indianapolis 500. Yep, the Indy 500 was part of the Formula 1 World Championship until the early 1960s. And if we're to add in the drivers who were killed in practice, qualifying or the race for the Indy 500, those drivers were Chet Miller, Bill Vukovic, Manny Ayulo, Keith Andrews, Pat O'Connor, Jerry Unser Jr. and Bob Kortner. The total drivers killed in that decade then goes up from 4 to 10. However, that's up for debates in the comments as the Indy 500 fatalities skew the statistics slightly. If you include the Belgian Charles de Tonaco, Eugenio Castellotti, Mario Alberghetti and Cameron Earl from testing fatalities and non-championship races, the total killed during the period 1950 to 1959 is 15. Without the Indy 500 deaths, it's 9. So then, moving on into the 1960s, often considered to be the deadliest period in motorsport history, not just in Formula 1. By this point, we're not including Indy 500 deaths because any deaths at the Indy 500 happened after it was removed from the calendar. So it's purely F1 World Championship events, testing and non-championship rounds that will be counted here. And already just within 1960, we have our first death, the American Harry Shell, who was killed at Silverstone during a non-championship event. Then it's the 1960 Belgian Grand Prix where Alan Stacey and Chris Bristow were killed during the race. What happened here is that Alan Stacey was hit in the face by a bird and crashed and was subsequently killed. Whether he was killed by the bird or just knocked out and then later killed is up for debate. But with Chris Bristow, he crashed at Burnhamville Corner, a very long right-hander taken at quite high speed, where he lost control, crashed and landed in a barbed wire fence, whereupon he was decapitated. In 1961, Wolfgang von Trips and several spectators were killed at Monza after he and Jim Clark accidentally tangled. But the big problem that these cars had in the 60s and into the 70s was fire. John Taylor, Lorenzo Bandini, Joe Schlesser in the 1960s all died when their cars caught fire. Joe Schlesser's being just absolutely horrendous if you read into the details of that accident. And then into the 1970s, Piers Courage, Peter Revson, Joe Siffin, and Roger Williamson all died in fires. You could almost add Nicky Lauda to that list. We'll get into the 1970s in a minute, but when you add up all of the deaths from the 1960s across testing, non-championship races and championship races, the total killed stands at 14. Now, depending on how you look at this based off the stats from the 50s, it's only one less, and that's in big inverted commas. But when you exclude the Indy 500 fatalities, it's a worrying amount more. And like I said, you know, just one more would have been too many. In the 1960s, the only two years without a fatality were 1963 and 1965. The 1970s, meanwhile, had probably the more graphic descriptions of deaths to drivers in this time. Jochen Rindt had his throat slashed in his fatal accident. There's the drivers I already mentioned in fires. Helmut Kerning was decapitated. And then there's Tom Price. At the 1977 South African Grand Prix, Renzo Zorzi had pulled to the side of the track with his car on fire just after the kink, which leads from the final corner to the start-finish line, which, you know, on the old layout of Kyle Army before its, you know, reconstruction in time for 1992. What happened next is two marshals jumped over the barrier on the opposite side of the track to attend to this fire, and policy at that track was two marshals attended the fire to start with, with two waiting as backup, just in case. The first marshal was a 25-year-old man known only as Bill. The other was a 19-year-old called Frederick Janssen van Vuren, and I hope I've pronounced that name correctly. Now, what happened is, is that they both started to cross the track, just as Price and Hans Stuck came over the blind crest. Stuck managed to miss Bill by a hair, and we're talking cigarette paper thicknesses of missing. But Price wasn't able to react to van Vuren and hit him at 170 miles an hour. It has to be said 
that Van Vuren was also carrying a fire extinguisher that weighed somewhere in the region of about 40 pounds. There is no way of sugarcoating this, Van Vuren was absolutely mutilated from the impact. The fire extinguisher that he was carrying hit Price square in the head and killed him instantly. Because Price was dead in the car and you know, couldn't do anything, his foot was still planted firmly to the floor. The car carried on all the way to turn one where it hit Jacques Lafitte's Ligier. And the only way that they could identify which marshal had been killed was that they rounded them all up after the race and then went through the register and just went through process of elimination. The fire extinguisher that Van Vuren was carrying ended up being launched several hundred yards away and it ended up in one of the car parks where it hit a car so hard that the door couldn't be opened afterwards. Ronnie Peterson was the last driver killed in the 1970s which rounded out the total deaths of the decade to 12. Moving into the 80s, safety improved dramatically, and while Gilles Villeneuve, Riccardo Paletti, Elio De Angelis and Patrick Depaye would all lose their lives, four deaths versus 12 or even 15 seemed like a huge relief that finally the sport was making progress in terms of safety. Between 1982 and 1986 it had been the longest since 1960 that a driver had not been killed, and after 1986 there were no more deaths for the rest of the decade. But it's thought that complacency has started to creep in. The rush banning of driver aids in 1993 might have contributed to the deaths of Ayrton Senna and Roland Ratzenberger at the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix. The deaths of two drivers being beamed alive into people's living rooms all around the world shocked the sport and also embarrassed the sport into making really, really rash changes. And now Formula One takes safety very seriously. 20 years would then pass before Bianchi's accident at Suzuka with the period 2000 to 2009 being the only decade in which a driver has not been killed in a Formula 1 car. Oh and I should mention that there are names on the list of deceased F1 drivers who have died in classic F1 car racing but they've not been included on the list due to the cars not being in service as it were. And it is incredible just how many drivers would lose their lives in the 50s, 60s and 70s and then it just drop off in the 80s. It's as if a switch got flipped or something and looking into how many died per decade has been quite interesting and looking at the statistical side of it as opposed to before where it was just this guy did this and then this happened has made me learn quite a bit. And I hope you have learned something from it and if it's something that you didn't really think about until this video popped up in your you know, subscription feed or you recommended or whatever then do give this video a like and if you do want more from this series or more from me in general and you're not subscribed do get subscribed and get the bell on so you never miss out on a future video. Massive thanks as ever to the good folk of Patreon and if you want to help support me in a more personal level you can do so by following the link in the description where there will also be links to Discord and also to my social media stuff. So until next time, I've been Aidan Moore, have a great day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.